today's conversation will be enlightening as we hear from our peers across the country and our National Association about mobile driver licensing. If you have not uploaded the Summit app yet, we recommend uh, you do so. You can assess the event details. We're scheduling more information about our sponsors. There's also a game in the app, and the winning participant will receive a transportation summit theme gift. So make sure you, you sign in. To assess the app, visit your app store and search Cvent Events. Forms there are open it and search NC Transportation Summit 2023. For this session, please hold questions until the question and answer session at the end. There will also be a poll question during this panel that you can fill out on the app where you see this session listed. So please download the app now if you haven't already. For those of you who are logging professional development hours, it will be self-reporting this year. Our team will be sending the form to you all that check in today. You can fill that out and self-report and retain for your records. Now, we will get, go ahead and get started. Next, I'd like to introduce the panel moderator, North Carolina DMV Commissioner, Wayne Goodwin. Commissioner, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Board Member Mitchell, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we can do better than that. Good afternoon. good afternoon. All right, there we go. I know it's a tough time right after lunch, but this is a very important topic, and I appreciate your interest in this very timely topic for everybody. And again, thank you to uh, Board Member Mitchell for that introduction, and most of all, thank you for your, your dedicated service to our great state and for being a friend of the DMV. I'm very excited to be here with you today. Uh, again, my name is Wayne Goodwin. I'm our DMV Commissioner, but excited to be here with all of us at our 2023 uh, North Carolina Transportation Summit, and particularly excited about DMV's role in this event. Uh, this summit marks a bit of an anniversary uh, for me. In fact, just about a year ago, for those who may, may have been here last year, just about a year ago, I was appointed to serve as DMV Commissioner, and that was on a Friday. And the very next week was the Transportation Summit. So I dumped, jumped into the deep end at the very beginning. And it has been a whirlwind ever since. Now, I was so impressed by last year's summit, uh, you know, with the quality of the content and the information being shared, I knew then and there, you can ask the Secretary, I remember mentioning this to him then and there, that I thought that for, at that point next year, which is now this year, that DMV needed to have a more prominent role at the summit. And the secretary agreed, and now here we are. Uh, being the DMV commissioner is a, is, a, is a pretty big job. Of course, all jobs are big, and all jobs are important. And I love this, this role that I have as our DMV commissioner. We have an extremely dedicated uh, group of colleagues, employees, and partners who t do a terrific job uh, meeting the mission of the DMV, and there's a, a lot to that mission. We just don't have enough of them. So to that end, I'm very pleased to share with you and remind you that as part of this summit, uh, I want to share with you about and remind you about the career fair that uh, is happening as we speak. If you or someone you know is interested in learning more about working for DMV or North Carolina Department of Transportation and the many jobs that we have available, please stop by room 304 today. Is that right, Marty? 304 uh, today or tomorrow and talk to our hiring managers. We'd love to have you join the team. And speaking of the team, now I'm, I know I'll get in trouble when I start naming names, uh, and of course everybody's special, but we have some extra special folks who are here with us today. You can raise your hand if you like, uh, or stand. Um, Deputy Commissioner Charlotte boyd Millette. She chose to raise her hand, okay. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Paula Winley. I think she's on her way. We, uh, we have uh, Director Mike Newsom and Director Jennifer Keel. Uh, Chief Deputy Manley could not be here with us, but we have a terrific team and there's others here and uh, I'm just very thankful for what each and every one of the team members do. Now, to the reason that we are all gathered here today, and that's to hear about mobile driver licensing, uh, otherwise known as MDL. 
And you know in the, when you work in the business of DOT and DMV, you have a lot of acronyms. Well, here's another one, MDL. Today, you're going to learn about what it is and what it isn't and where and how it has been implemented and what we can learn as we look to our own potential impl implementation here in the Tar Heel State. Now, as the title of the session states, MDL is the future of DMV. It's the future of licensing and proof of identity. Now, AMVA, there's another acronym, uh, the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, AMVA, defines MDL as a driver license that is provisioned to a mobile device with the capability to be updated in real time. It's comprised of the same data elements that are used to produce a physical driver license that we have. Uh, however, the data is transmitted electronically to a relying party's reader device and then authenticated. The MDL is a significant improvement over physical credentials. Think about the card that you have, whether it's a driver license or, or a state ID. Think about that card in, your, in your, your physical wallet or your pocketbook, which in and of itself can easily be lost or stolen. It become broken or damaged. It may contain outdated information. It may offer too much information, including personally identifiable information, and can be more easily replicated by counterfeiters. So already from the get-go, we're talking about how MDL can address uh, and mitigate or prevent some of those concerns. The MDL, as you'll hear more about here in a moment, the MDL offers safe, secure, and trustable technologies that allow for completely touchless transactions, selective information release, data protection, and so much more. Now, in North Carolina, we pride ourselves in being the first in many things. Uh, we at DMV even put it on our license plates. First in flight, first in freedom. There's nobody from Ohio here, I presume. <laughs> but we are not first. Oh, you're from Ohio, that's right. <laughs> but we are not first in adopting MDL. Today, we are going to hear from some early adopters, and I hope we learn some things, and I'm confident we'll learn some things, that will help us as we, as a state, as a state drive towards our MDL implementation. Now, before we get to our speakers, I uh, want to make sure you have all opened the app. You've heard this multiple times throughout the day already. Open the event app and find this specific session. And as I'm going to speak a little s more slowly so you can get to it, uh, and the reason why I'm asking you to check your app is so you can then go to this session and then go to answer our poll question if you haven't already done so. And we'll use the answers to this question to steer our conversation today. The poll question is this. If getting a mobile driver license was available in your state, would you want to have it added to your smartphone? And uh, we look forward to hearing your, your uh, confidential responses. And you'll see there are four choices. So please go ahead and answer this question now. And as I said, we'll review your responses later in this session. And I'm gonna go ahead and pause for a, for a moment uh, now to allow time for you all to answer before we move on. beauty of the app you'll see is that in real time you can see that people are actually following the directions I just gave you and they're answering the survey. All right, I trust you've done that. If you haven't, please continue doing that. So thank you everybody and now we'll hear from some of our colleagues from around the country. First up is Louisiana. You can probably tell which one of my panelists up here is from Louisiana. Representing the Louisiana Office of Motor Vehicles is Paige Paxton. Uh, Paige began her motor vehicle career in 2006 and has been the field administrator for, I guess, South Louisiana, is that right? Since 2017. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm North Carolina welcome to Paige Paxton. I've been at many of these meetings. 
it's always boring after lunch. So we're gonna have a little bit of fun first. They only give me ten minutes, so I gotta make it quick. For those who are watching at home, <laughs> Ms. Paxton is performing a Mardi Gras ritual and handing out beads and doing a dance and Lord knows what else. She's making her way back around the, the auditorium. Straight back from the bayou, Paige Paxton. Okay. Where's my clicker? <laughs> like, it's so fun, right, to sit in these meetings. You got to make them fun. Um, if my mouth gets stuck to my teeth like Mr. Ed, it's a new medicine that I'm on, so you just have to let me unstick them. Okay, I'm catching my breath. Hold on. Whew. Okay. We, my name is Paige Paxton, uh, Louisiana Office of Motor Vehicles. We actually implemented our mobile DL in, which button is the clicker? The top one or the yellow one? Oh, that one? It ain't working. What, that'll work, there you go. Um, we implemented early in 2018 and we chose to do a state specific for us. I'm gonna need that water. As far as you know, that's all it is. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Um, we, I have, I have created a PowerPoint, and uh, anybody that knows me, I don't really go from a PowerPoint. I feel like if you wanted to read it, you could go home and read it in real time, right? But this was an early adoption for us, and what we did was the first vision that we had was as a wallet, because we wanted a one-stop shop. We wanted you to be able to present your license, your vehicle registration, and your car insurance at traffic stops. What we did not foresee is all of the people who reached out to us when we went live. All these state agencies started contacting us saying, we want to ride with y'all. We want to get on, on board with y'all. And that was where the cascading effect came into place. Now, preparing the state. Okay. If you don't have legislation, you need to have something in legislation that's going to force people to utilize it. And it's a simple thing that we did first was law enforcement at simple traffic stops had to accept that as a form of credential. Whenever they, it turned into an arrest, they could then ask for the court because you're still required to carry it. And I foresee it in the, I think it'll be a long time before we leave the plastic behind. The representative who passed it was Ted James. And I love Mr. Ted, but let me tell you what he did to me. We released in production in the end of June of 2018. And we did it in secret. I didn't want press releases. I didn't want anybody to know. Let's release this with our family members and coworkers, and let's see what happens. Because if it breaks, we can just pull it back. And he tweeted it at like midnight. So all day on July 4th, I was at a barbecue drinking beer and doing interviews all day long about something that I wasn't supposed to be talking about yet. Preparing residents. We, part of the standard is no flash pass. We do have a flash pass and it's going to remain that way for Louisiana. You can have state-specific stuff. And for us, people, if you give somebody something that's a complete 180, they're gonna reject it. So what you have to do is implement in pieces to where people recognize it and just change it a little bit over time for them to accept it. And that's what we've chosen to do. Preparing residents, um, I'll tell y'all a little sticker. I was telling them earlier that when we were trying to train people on how to use it. I am from a little town called Letsworth, AKA Deliverance, okay? There's about 200 people that live there and I thought if I could get my 75 year old mom to be able to use this, we're good. So I did and she actually was able to utilize it. And all of her little friends at coffee, they have a coffee club by the way. They all met up and they all have mobile deal now. They all were able to download it. Legislation equivalent to the plastic. 
when other agencies started reaching out to us, I did not anticipate that it was gonna be Secretary of State that wanted to use it in the next election. I did not anticipate that it would be the wildlife and fisheries that wanted their credentials to be attached. Also the nursing boards, the physician boards, the bank institutions, all these people reached out because they wanted something. And at that point, I think we started realizing that we were way behind the times with these plastic cards. And I actually started watching to see how people utilize their plastic card. I was sitting in the bar, I promise, but just for, you know, trying to get some information. I, it wasn't for fun. And I watched, we just hand over that license, that bouncer at the door. We all do it. He's got every bit of your information. He's got your address. He's got the appointment, apartment number you live in. And you just hand it over to him and just waiting to go inside. And I realized how dangerous that really was. And that it was time to move forward with something that wasn't so dangerous. Law enforcement, state police was pretty easy. You know, they were helping us to build what they wanted to see. And what we fell into is the smaller towns, trying to make sure that we included them in whatever we were actually building, that we didn't just leave them out. And we actually reached out to the public and said, what do you want to see? I know what I want on it, but I want to hear what you want on it. And we started to get all these feedback from people saying, I want my concealed handgun, I want my wife and fisheries. So that's the first things we went after. COVID. Everybody knows when COVID hit, right? The whole world shut down. New York, Louisiana was one of the first states to shut down. We shut down in mid-March of 2020. We were right along with New York, and we swear it was because of Mardi Gras that we had so many cases. What I did not have was a way to help people. I didn't have any way to help these people who wanted to get their the food stamps or the unemployment started, or so I thought. But I did, I had LA Wallet. And so what happened is those agencies jumped on board and started using this as a verification process. And we thought they wanted, we saw we do a little pilot. Let's see what happens. Send me some names, we're gonna verify them. We're gonna see how many kick out. 50,000 people kicked out. Only about 1,250 went through. So we thought, it's not working. And they said, nope, that's our fraud. That's the amount of fraud we get. And so that was an amazing thing for us. Because I don't know about y'all, but Louisiana's broke. We need to save all our money. The autism indicator went on our driver's license this last session. It was passed, last session. And we actually were able to implement it on our mobile deal. It's actually there for... I don't know who other states have that. We had, they wanted an autism indicator and to try to help law enforcement to understand when somebody wasn't as compliant as they wanted, as they wanted them to be. You know, and you really don't know that. You think they're just being difficult and they're really not. So we were able to add that on LA Wallet. That was recent. I'm gonna I'm scroll through these because I only got 10 minutes, let's see. This is, this is my favorite. This is my gecko board. What they created for me is that I can watch this board in real time 24 seven. And it gives me what information, and it doesn't give specific information about the person, but it does give me the amount of people that I have. And we, we currently have 1.5 million plus people who are actually have LA wallet. So for us, that was huge. And guess what, we didn't crash. It didn't crash when we had that many people. And that was just an amazing feat for us. Okay, <laughs> this was our favorite comment that somebody left. I don't know if y'all can see it in the bottom left-hand corner. We actually received a comment where he said, I'll be doing the most random stuff when I'm high. I just really said, let me go check my LOL and make sure my license is still valid. <laughs> we, we don't, we hope he didn't drive after that, but it's amazing the people that, you know, the things they'll say. COVID vaccinations, Louisiana, New Orleans made it mandatory that the only way you could get into a building in New Orleans was to have, in the city of New Orleans, had to, you had to show vaccination status. So we had that, you know, we implemented that on this mobile deal and it's connected straight with LDH, which is our hospital and our department hospital. So they, they keep the information up and it's constantly hitting and as you approve. I'm not gonna say that aged well, but we did do it. Remote verification, Louisiana, 
that was part of the DSNAP and the unemployment, the food stamps is part of that. But we also have what we call um, like delivery of alcohol. Imagine that, huh? We deliver alcohol right next to the burger. And <laughs> this was, they wanted to use this to verify a person's age. And it, it has grown so much of how many people are able to utilize this verification process. And it's just a code that gets sent to them. And you, as the recipient, have this code. You have to enter it, and it tells them that you're validating who you are. Oh, yeah, the court. Whenever, during COVID, you know, court shut down, but eventually they opened it up virtually. And that was a verification process, was using LA Wallet to make sure the person you're dealing with and their record is the one that's actually on the other end of that camera. I already talked about the fraud prevention, so I'll skip on past that because I don't think I have very many. Oh, this is my favorite, organ donation. Our Louisiana organ donation, which is OPA, LOPA, they actually reached out to us and said, we want to utilize LA Wallet to have people actually put down they want to be an organ donor. Because, you know, they come to me, they do it every six years, you know, they make the decision. They are able to make this at any moment. Oh, they had over 2,000 organ donor recipients almost immediately. And that I think they saved, what, eight people? Or either five to eight people per actual um, organ donation registration. So that was a huge one that we were really proud of. Okay, I'm saying thank you, but I'm not finished. Imagine that, huh? There is a, we just started something new, which is why it's not in my slides. We have a, an adult content verification process now. And Louisiana decided that they wanted to verify your true age if you were somebody that was looking at adult content on the internet. And it doesn't keep your name, I checked that, right? It's literally a yes or a no. So if you're under the age, it doesn't allow you access. And I think that's something we've all kind of just skimmed over is the ramifications of these children only seeing this. So we were, we were very thankful that we were able to get that implemented just a couple of weeks ago. But, and that's the end of my presentation. I know I can't ask questions. <laughs> And as a reminder, everybody will have questions during the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Paige. Next is someone who may have traveled the farthest to be here with us today. Ryan Williams is here today representing the Utah Department of Public Safety Driver License Division. Ryan has been with the division since 2011, where he is the Quality Assurance and IT Program Manager. Please give a warm North Carolina welcome to Ryan Williams. Thank you. I'm going to attempt to do something as uh, somebody who works with IT, never do this, do a live demonstration with a group of people because it never seems to work out exactly how you want it to. But I thought I'd kick off my presentation with an actual live transaction so you can see an MDL, see how that's consumed. Because as Paige mentioned, an MDL isn't what you see or show. They, it's not a flash pass. It's what you verify. So you're verifying that credential, you're verifying every element of data on that, that it's signed um, with your private key and that matches up with a public key and all that information is transferred electronically. So you're not just you know, taking a picture of your license and showing that where somebody could easily swap out the picture or swap out the birth date and show that to you and, and you would never know the difference because you're not verifying that. So I wanted to show a transaction, so I'm going to attempt to do that. And then we'll, uh, sorry, this will take just a minute as I have to switch. Let me try and actually show you on my phone. Um, let me give that just a second to load up here. Yay, I tested it right before this and it worked and it worked this time, so good deal. So this is uh, when I open up my MDL, this is what I'm seeing. So open that up, I have to have my face, fingerprint, uh, six-digit pin. I have to have know that in order to access this. Plus to open my phone, I have to do the same thing. So that has to be used twice. Um, this is just some general information. If I go to my profile, um, Utah has a pre-consent. So you're, you're choosing what data you're sharing. Um, when you're sharing it, this is share age. So the data that I see or you see up here is what I'm willing to share. 
if I move this over to address, so age is like for a bar or restaurant, um, uh, that sort of thing where you're maybe purchasing ammunition. Um, the next one is, gives more information is your contact info, checking into a hotel where they want your name and address, um, that sort of thing. And then our third, third uh, I guess, slide is the full information. So this is law enforcement renting a car. This has all of my driving information on there as well. So when I share that information, um, Paige talked a little bit about how you can redact information that, that you share. If you see age verification here, I'm actually showing a lot of information up there and that's due to Utah's laws. We have some very specific laws where you have to show date of birth, you have to have license number, you have to have the issue date and the expiration date. Outside of Utah, where a state doesn't have those laws, I can turn that off and share just this. But when I share this, when I go into, I'm gonna do an age verification here. When I go into a bar, and I need to show that bartender or bouncer my information. I just click this, uh, this button, this QR button down here at the bottom that you see, and it presents a QR code. So this is all that that person is going to see is this information here. And hopefully I can switch over quickly to a verifier. We'll let that load up before I do it. So I have my QR code's good for 60 seconds. So. So this is my verifier. So now this is the view that the, the uh, bartender or bouncer has is this verifier. So they're going to choose the QR verification. And as you can see, this will be a live transaction. It's all contactless. So this is what they see. They see a picture of me and they see my age. That's all the information that they need to, do, to have in order to serve me. So it redacts that information. And so pretty simple transaction, pretty straightforward. It's redacting all of that information that you don't need and, and taking that, um, that control and putting that into the, into the hands of the user. Um, so very much a safety and security thing. And I wanted to do that because a picture speaks a thousand words and, and hopefully you seeing what an MDL is or what it can be, a version of that, really gives you a better idea as we, as we go through the rest of this. So I'm gonna switch back over and do a quick presentation here. I think we have some things happening here. Come on. Perhaps not. This is dark. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Save the day right there. Um, so now I want to talk to you about our solution and the way that we implemented the, the MDL solution. So this is a quick overview. Again, I have a short period of time, um, but more than willing, we're going to answer some questions later. We'll talk about uh, anything that, that we don't cover. Uh, so how it began for us, in 2019, we passed Senate Bill 100, which uh, was a pretty basic bill, but it put in place our entire uh, transition to moving to an MDL. It, it laid out that we had to do an RFA, RFI, a request for information in 2019, 2020 to do an RFP, 2021 move into a pilot, an active pilot, and 2022 move into production. So that was a very, very fast timeline for us. It, it flew by and I wish that we had more time in order to do that. Um, but when that happened, we, we took a little bit of a different approach than some of the other states had taken at that time. And I like to call this the ecosystem-based approach. So had this idea, they came to me uh, um, as the quality assurance manager and I'm one of those other duties as assigned people. That's my job description is other duties as dis assigned. Said, hey, we're gonna do this MDL. Um, let's, let's sit down and hash out and talk about it. 
But before we went to that RFI and went out there to see what information it was there, I said, if we're going to make this work, I want it to be usable. Uh, it has to be usable out in, out in the wild, out in public when people go out there to use it. If they don't have anywhere to use it, it's going to fall on its face. It's going to be a novelty that you put on your phone. And Paige spoke about that earlier. And, and it's going to go away really fast or people will lose interest. So what I did was went, went out and invited the public sector and the relying parties into our RFI and said, what do you need to see from it? So I went out and I talked to banks. I talked to retailers. I talked to uh, hotels. I talked to um, the DABC, the liquor stores, the uh, pharmacies. I talked to as many people as I could talk to and said, hey, we're, this is happening. It's going, this is our timeline. But I'd love for you to come see the RFI and see what an MDL is. And you learn about it while I'm learning about it so that we can come up with a solution that's going to work for everybody. And so that's what I did, boots on the ground, and went out and started uh, hitting up these relying parties. So that ecosystem is the relying party, the citizen, and the driver's license division. And so in for order for that to work, you have to have all of those pieces. Because there were, there were quite a few pilots that went out there, and they did a pilot, but it was just their, the people within their organization, and they had one thing where they could try it and said, yeah, this is neat. Um, and then there's some people that launch that don't have a place to use it. They've got this MDL, but there's no, no place to consume that MDL. And by doing that, it really helped me kick off our MDL and get it out there to where people can use it. And I have people just thriving to have more places to use it all the time. So we came up with this idea of re relying party events. So what a relying party event is, first, what's a relying party, right? That's anybody who consumes an MDL. So, you know, the, the banks, the pharmacies, the liquor stores, uh, law enforcement, um, all those places that I talked about. So in order to provision our MDL during this pilot phase and even moving into production, um, we had an event. So what's an event? It's somewhere where we can promote the MDL and we can show people how it works and show them in real time after we provision, let them actually use it in a real life setting. Um, so why do an event? It promotes the ecosystem. It gives people a chance to see what an MDL is and what it isn't, where they can use it, how they can use it, and educate them. Because that's one of our toughest pieces is to educate the public on how this can be used and how it should be used and how it shouldn't be used. And that became apparent at our very first, uh, at our very first event. It was in a, in a bank. We had uh, like 500 people show up and, and line up and we're we're provisioning, we're giving the speech to everybody, hey, this is how you use it. Where we're standing is the only place you can use. Nowhere else in the state has the verifier side it. This is the only place you can use it. We were there for about four hours provisioning, and before we left, we had people, when you shake our app, you can provide feedback. We had people saying, hey, I just tried to use this down at the liquor store and they won't take it. Hey, I tried to use it. So people don't listen, but uh, that event execution is your best opportunity to get in front of them and show them the transaction like I just showed you. Show them how they should be doing that. Show them that they don't want to show all their information to somebody. They want to show a QR code. They want to redact their information, keep their stuff private, and keep it to themselves. So uh, it gives us an opportunity to provision, to educate, and also to do live use cases. Um, where we are now, uh, we just barely moved to production here at the end of 2022. Um, with uh, over 10,000, we had over 10,000 uh, people in our pilot. And since I did this a week and a half ago, we're at about 13,000. And we also did not do a huge announcement about our MDL going live. Um, we're trying to work with some other relying parties and uh, waiting, waiting for some bigger relying parties to come on board and, and make a big announcement. But we did some, uh, some social media, Twitter, Facebook posts, uh, showing that our MDL is live, and that's where we're getting those folks in it, and it's taking off right now. Um, I talked about the relying parties. We have America First Credit Union, Utah Community, Harmon's Grocery, Harmon's Pharmacy, our various DABSs, um, uh, another pharmacy in, in Ogden, in, in the northern part of our state, and Utah Highway Patrol all have ver verifiers at this point and can be used. So you, people are actually out there using. We're seeing transactions happen. We don't see the transactions happen. We hear back from, from our vendors and say, okay, a transaction happened because we're not, that's something that we also don't want to track. We don't want to be tracking where people are using it and how they're using it. So my feet, when people say, well, how much is it getting used? I don't know. I have to turn to our vendors and say, 
you know, are, are you seeing transactions? How often are you using this? And, and how often is that happening? Um, I think I, that pretty much wraps it up. So we'll do some questions a little bit. Yeah. It is. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ryan. Next is someone that can give us a look at the national picture on MDL. Mike McCaskill is the uh, Director of Identity Management for the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, that's AMVA, which I mentioned earlier, which is our national association for the DMV. So please welcome to the mic, Mike McCaskill. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so I think I should start off with uh, a little bit about uh, where the MDL came from and why it's important. Uh, all of you right now, well, all of you right now should have at least a physical credential in your wallet today, your driving credential or an identity card at least. And if you look at that, they all look very similar. The picture's in a certain place, your address is in a certain place, your name is in a certain place, your signature is in a certain place, and that's because of standards. And AMBA over the years has uh, used the ISO standardization process to create the, the North American standard for the card design. And that's why your card looks the way it does. Well, for mobile driver license to be similar to your physical credential, it needed to be able to be used in the exact same fashion. What do I mean by that? Well, what I really mean by that is it needs to be privacy preserving. It needs to be interoperable. You can go any state or sometimes any country and use your driver license and they will accept that as your ID. And it needs to be secure. It needs to secure the data that it has about you, which are all pillars that you use for your physical card. So we wanted to create an MDL that could be used just like your physical card. Same places, but have the same, actually better securities for the data because it's not in full view all the time when you hand over the physical credential. So the ISO group that worked on this standard is working group 10. We actually have the convener to that working group in our audience today. He's a colleague of mine at AMVA, Lafayette Jordan. And they, they've been working on this standard for about 10 or so, maybe a few more years, with input from all the DMVs around North America, because AMVA also has a working group that both Paige and Ryan have been on that have established the requirements for the ISO standard. So the standard was built around requirements from the DMVs, privacy securing or preserving, interoperable, data security, all of that played into the standard. Um, fast forward to today, uh, well, fast forward to about a year ago, a little over a year ago, September of, of last year ago, last year, we've been, we published the first 18013 Part 5 ISO standard for MDL, MDL interoperability. And once that happened, states began building toward that standardization, or that standard. And what does that really mean? That means that I can create, a, if I use that standard to build an MDL, and relying parties use that same standard to build their consumption applications or their reader applications, that I can take my MDL anywhere that has an MDL reader and can, and can use it. That's what it means, it's interoperable anywhere, not just in the state that I got it issued to me in, but also in any other state that would accept an MDL. So in U U.S. and Canada, we have a lot going on right now. And I would actually say to expand this slide a little bit uh, worldwide, there's even more going on worldwide. There are a lot of countries now that are building toward this, Japan, several countries in Europe, uh, a couple of the states in Australia. In fact, we just got back from a summit, a global summit on uh, mobile driver licenses where Europe, Australia, and the U.S. were, were involved and there's a lot of activity. But at home here in the US, uh, we've got several states who are actually issuing ISO standardized credentials today. They're the blue and green boxes on this map. And I think they should look blue. They are blue. Uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Connecticut's coming, 
Maryland, Delaware, they're all issuing credentials today in some fashion that are ISO compliant, which means built properly, they should be able to be interoperable between their states and uh, between their readers in each, in each other's states. Now, this map didn't look this way always. There were, there were a few states on this map before that were doing, as Paige described, a state-specific implementation where they used uh, whatever their needs were. They implemented their needs at the time because there was no standard. They were the early adopters that actually we garnered a lot of information from to help build the standard better. So we've gotten a lot of information from those states. But I can say today with certainty, because I've actually talked to Paige also about this, every state that did a state-specific implementation is now working toward or, or already has implemented an ISO compliant solution. So what that should tell you is every state jurisdiction in North, well, every jurisdiction in the U.S. are all working toward an ISO 18013 Part 5 compliant standardized solution so that they're interoperable, so that they're privacy preserving, so that their, their data security is, is much better than the card security. What that really means is over time and as this snowball continues to grow, all the states will be working toward the same standard. But that also means that all states are going to have public keys that the relying parties need to get access to and be assured that that public key belongs to that state. That's a true issuing authority for a credential. They can rely on it. They can trust it. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to ensure that relying parties can get a list of public keys that they can trust? Well, that's the digital trust service that AMBA is now building, AMBA, the association that I work for. Uh, several years ago, two or three years ago, AMBA did a RFI, Request for Information, and they asked the industry, should somebody do a digital trust service or a central list of public keys? And if so, who do you think that should be? That was the basic two questions that we asked. Overwhelmingly, they said yes, and it needs to be you, AMBA. AMBA sits in the center of all of the jurisdictions. We represent all of the jurisdictions in North America. We're already a trusted entity, and we don't have uh, what I'll call skin in the game as far as the financial means. We want this to work for the jurisdictions and for the relying parties. We're in it to make sure it's better for them. So they all agreed, most of them agreed, that we should be that, that group. But what is the digital trust really? What's behind the digital trust? What is it more than just a list? Well, one of the things that, uh, one of the first things that we want to do with the digital trust service is simplify relying party trust. Now, just so you're aware, just because you're a DMV doesn't mean you're just an issuing authority. You're also a relying party because you're going to be trusting credentials coming in from other jurisdictions and using those as maybe part of your identity process for issuing your own credential. Issuing authorities are all relying parties. Well, how can they trust that the keys that they're getting are from a true relying party, that that relying party, I'm sorry, issuing authority, that that issuing authority abides by certain minimum requirements so they're protecting their keys, they're identifying their folks properly and those kinds of things. How are they assured that, they're, that they are abiding by that minimum set of standards or uh, of uh, standards? And, uh, and also um, make it easy for them to get that list of public keys. It needs to be an easy process for them to get that list downloaded to all of their readers so that they use it and they want to consume it. So. That's one of the things that the Digital Trust Service will do. We'll give them a one-stop shop for all of the public keys and provide the relying parties assurances that those are true issuing authorities, that they are supposed to be issuing credentials, and that that is their true public key. Um, another thing we want to do with it is establish issuing authority best practices. Well, what do I mean by that? What all of the issuing authorities today, all of the states who issue identity credentials, follow policy and law in their state and national law in the sense of real ID. For those of you who haven't heard of real ID, the one that they just kicked down the road again for another two years, it's the federal requirements for you to issue credentials so that they can be used for federal purposes, AKA so you can fly. 
That's basically, that's one of the biggest issues you'll use with a real ID card. Well, we want to use the DTS to onboard issuing authorities, and as we are doing that, ensure that they are um, working towards uh, issue, uh, using minimum requirements so that the, 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 ish, the relying parties can trust that the issuing authorities are doing the right things to identify the people to issue those credentials to. And as they are issuing the credentials, provisioning them to their uh, mobile devices, that they're provisioning in a way that's secure and, and trustable. Another thing we want to do is minimize the number of standards doing the same thing. Folks, there are many standards for issuing a, an identity credential over the internet. WC3 has some, ISO has some, other parties have standards. But in order for issuing authorities to be interoperable, they have to all converge onto one standard so that that standard is used for building the MDL or the identity and also relying parties know how to consume that. So they have, we want to use it to, to, uh, to, to have all the issuing authorities come to one standard and minimize the number of standards doing the same thing. And then the last thing we want to do is counter solutions that have bad security or privacy issues in them. The last thing any of us want to do is issue a credential to somebody that could get them hurt, get their identity stolen, get their data stolen, make, them, make it a non-private issue. So we want to ensure that as we're onboarding those issuing authorities that their processes are providing the most secure privacy preserving credential that they can provide as best we can. So what that does is it provides a central source for the relying parties that include issuing authorities to know that when I get this list of keys, the issuing authorities have been through a process to ensure that it's theirs, they're a true issuing authority, and that their processes are trustable for issuing that credential. That is the end of what I really wanted to say today. I hope the questions and answers get us to some of the other topics that we also could talk about. Thank you, Mike, for that national overview. And I believe it's, it's available elsewhere, linked elsewhere. But uh, when you get a chance outside of uh, this meeting, you may want to uh, go to YouTube. There's an AMVA video entitled A Digital ID for the 21st Century. And it's a very, it's an animated video. And it certainly, uh, helps provide a, a, a very good overview in about what six minutes I think uh, I found it uh, enlightening speaking of enlightening we're going to review the results to our poll question from earlier and we did have folks who participated in that and here's what we have uh, four percent voted for yes I already have one from my home state so that must be somebody who's not from North Carolina this is probably Paige and Ryan you didn't know okay <laughs> so so maybe a few others all right uh, next up uh, the second option which says, yes, I'm an early adopter and can't wait to just have it on my phone, 71%. And that's, of course, where, where I personally am. Uh, the third option, 13%, which says, I'm not sure. I'd have to learn more about it first, see how it works. That's where we, why we're here today, to learn. And the last option, 12% uh, uh, voted for, no, I'm concerned about the safety of having my identity compromised by having it on my phone. And maybe we can address some of those uh, concerns today. So we're now going to move along to our uh, panel discussion portion of our session, and we'll start with, with um, and we've already gotten to the reaction to the, to the poll question, heard some responses, but we're now going to ask my panelists here, my colleagues, um, about their responses to the poll question. So this is for all three, Paige, Ryan, and Mike, and we'll first go in that order. Uh, are these responses in line with what you might expect for a state that does not yet have MDL? Um, yes. Honestly, a lot. It, that, I think the response would be a lot of people who actually have an MDL. You know, we actually have one. You're always going to have the people that are telling you, I'm scared of the security. I'm scared that somebody's going to take my information. Well, I can assure you they will get your information faster from that credential in your pocket than they will from that mobile deal. And once you show people that and they start to understand that they are handing their life away with that card, you lost your wallet, your driver's license is gone, and it provides everything that somebody needs to know about you. Whereas that with your phone, first of all, nobody loses their phone if they can help it. We all know this, right? If that's the one thing you're going to have your hand on. But you have to have a code or a facial recognition or a thumbprint to get into your phone 
and then you have to have it again, something different to get into your app. I don't need that if you throw it out the window in a cigarette pack. I can just grab your license. So to me, even even in, even after you've implemented, you're going to have that same that percentage. All right, Ryan. There's yeah. no, no Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I think that we saw similar results, and we went out to and did these events where we were just randomly seeing the public. I mean, we announced them. We had uh, media. We had uh, people on the radio saying, hey, come down to this bank, and they're going to be provisioning. Um, but as people came in and people that didn't see that, we saw about the same thing. Probably 78 to 80 percent were like, heck yes, sign me up. I, I would love to, to test this out and try it out. And there were um, the concerns about safety and security. And so really, I think that that's pretty accurate. I think the room is a, a good reflection of that. Mike? Uh, yeah, nationally, I think you see the same thing. But I think one of the interesting things to think about here is the same number that, in my opinion, the same people who don't want an MDL also don't want a driver license. You have those people in your states who don't want to be on the, on the radar at all. They don't want to be identified. So you, you take those away. One of the interesting things these guys have been talking about, they didn't say it here, but I've also seen nationally, is the age groups that want them the, the, the quickest. From this morning, you heard that one of the generational folks were uh, tech savvy and we were all wrong. That's true. The age groups that want the MDLs across the country are actually older than you would think. Uh, and, it, and it does, to me, play back to the fact that I have a 15-year-old who could care less if he gets a driver license. I had to make him go take his test so I could quit taking him to practice. Well, that, that generational change is they don't care if they have an MDL, they don't care if they have a license. But those of us who need our licenses for identity, identity and driving every day, we want to have that more secure and easier to use credential. But it's about education. The more education that we get, that we've seen states give to their members before they get them, the more adoption they get. The less education, the less notice that they give them, the lower the adoption rates because they don't understand what they have and they don't understand how to use it. So, all right, thank you. And I think in your presentations, you, uh, Paige and Ryan, you've already discussed about the early adopters, the folks who started it, started it early on. Anything you want to add to that? Um, I might just put you back on what Mike said. So in our early, early adopters, our first and second customer who stood in line with those 500 people were 61 and 63 years old, both retired, and they were so excited to get the MDL on there. And, uh, and overall, we've seen about uh, a third of the people between 45 and 60 get an MDL. A third of them are, are probably from 30 to 45, and a third under under 30 so really it's been very evenly spread and my mind frame going into it was hey we're going to hit up like the college kids like my my son was has just finished college and he does every he doesn't even have a computer at his house he does everything on his phone and, and he's able to function that way all right well mike let's bounce back over to you i know you had your map that you showed us uh what about what other states are utilizing MDL. Can you explain a little bit? There are different options, different routes states are taking. Give a short overview about that. Uh, sure. So there are, there are roughly three, maybe four options for states to implement an MDL. They do their own thing. In other words, build their own MDL in their IT shops because it's doable. Uh, states can actually build to the standard and, and build an MDL. They can get a third party like their card vendors the card vendors that we have today are also MDL vendors there are other third party vendors who are not card vendors but they're all but they are MDL vendors who will build one for you or you can go the wallet route the big wallet route I'll call them the apples and the Googles uh, we've got a couple of states uh, actually two or three states now who have implemented the Apple solution and those are the solutions that you're hearing ba about at the airports the Apple solutions are uh, available at some of the limited number of airports around in the states that they've implemented. Um, so those are the avenues you can go as a state to implement an MDL solution. But the first thing that states are needing to do and are having to striving to do is get the legislation right. So that once you issue it, 
it can be used. Right now, in most states' legislation, you're required to carry your physical card. And you're required to present that physical card upon request from whomever is trying to identify you or check your driving privileges. <coughs> if you don't write in in the MDL version extension of that card, then it's not usable in your state unless your law is generic enough to allow it. So we are seeing states go back and, and try to make sure that their legislation is right, their rulemaking has happened, because a lot of times with legis new legislation comes rulemaking in your states, and then policy around those rules and requiring that policy be followed. So once you figure out how you want to do it and who you want to go with to build your MDL, you have to make sure you're actually building it to something that you can use. All right, thank you, Mike. And I know that in your presentations you referenced uh, some of the common concerns about the safety of MDL uh, and ways to address that. Perhaps uh, we should move to, to, uh, to the following uh, flip of that question, highlighting the advantages of having an MDL in place. And I guess that's a way to also counter the challenges. What are some of the advantages to having MDL in, MDL in place? And we're recording the session, so we want to make sure we highlight that to folks who watch this after today's conference. So first, Paige. Well, ours is one that I spoke in um, in my presentation about our food stamp program and our unemployment program. They were not able, like, they were shut down just like us, but they're still utilizing it after COVID because they don't want to see that many people in their offices. It is very simple now for someone to get the services they need, and we're able to verify that they are the, actually the people that need them. But they're not sitting in Puerto Rico just hitting us up trying to get food stamps, and that happens. And to me, that was one of the things I didn't see in the beginning. Because like for Louisiana, we, on Mike's map, we're in a different color because we are built to the ISO standard. We just don't see a need to release that version yet until more states come on board because we have other things we want to do right now and like that, the food stamps. And we want to, and it's not as easy when you're using apps, you have to depend on them. When you, when you send it to them, you have to wait for them to decide they're going to release it. You know, it's like we're in the Apple, so we're in the Google Play. And, but the main thing we saw, what continued, the reason you need it is because the actual age verification, right? Like I was, I was talking earlier about your license, the safety for only showing people what they actually need to see is amazing to me. And it's just something I never thought about. I never thought about me handing over my credential was probably really dangerous, you know? And so to me, that's one of the main uses that I would like to see for it. So as far as the safety and security aspects, they're, they're just huge. I think about this. If I lose my physical wallet, if I left that sitting on a counter at the, at the McDonald's and when I paid and walked away and the customer behind me picked that up, he would have all my credit cards, he would have my license with my address, um, f full information on there, and there's no way for me to get that back, right? Like if he decides to take that, I'm out of luck. With an MDL, in order to access that MDL, if I leave my phone there and that's on my phone, then he needs my face or my fingerprint to open up my, to open up my phone. He also needs my face, fingerprint, or pin to open up my MDL once he gets to that point in order to just access that. And the, the same thing with all the credit cards or, or any Apple Pay that I have on my phone. He's going to need something from me in order to get that access. So if I lose that phone, it's very, there's people smart enough out there to hack it, right? Like there's people smart enough to build the security. There's people smart enough to hack the security. Don't challenge, <laughs> don't challenge but, <laughs> but with my phone, I can also remotely wipe that. I can, right. remove, I, I can remove everything from my phone remotely. So if I lose that and I can't remember where I put it or can't find it with, or I get a new one, it's remotely wipeable. With my wallet, it's not. So those security uh, fears are handled by that. One other thing that people really worry about is, is like database. What if, what if there is a hack? And, and we had a conversation earlier about that. And so I wanted to just touch on that. We already have a, data, a database with all of your information in it, right? Like we are collecting your social, your passport, your birth certificate, all this stuff when you're coming in to be compliant and issue you an ID. That's already in a database. If you get an MDL, there's not more there. 
There's not an additional amount. In fact, uh, with, uh, with our vendor and we partnered with, we have a separate database that only issues the, or only moves in the information that's on a driver's license into that. So the passport information, the social security that we collected, all of that information is actually separate and secure, but it's the same security that we already have on the database, whether you have an MDL or don't have an MDL. So you, it's not going to be more likely that that's hacked or easier. It's the same risk that we're running today, that any state that doesn't have an MDL has the exact same risk as I do with an MDL. Thank you. All right. uh, Mike, what would an AMBA uh, state or the advantages to having MDL in place? When's the last time you pulled your driver license out for driving? Unless you've been stopped by law enforcement or just rented a car, you haven't. Uh, most of the time it stays in your wallet until you check in at a hotel or somebody wants to identify you in some way. And let's face it, most people don't lose their physical card. I know we have many who do, but on the, on the vast majority of the people, get their card, put it in the wallet, they only pull it out when they need it, and they keep it. But every time they pull it out, they pull out everything they own. They pull out their name, their date of birth, their address, their picture, their, their driving privileges, whatever's on the face and the back of that driver license. And that's what the relying party that they're handing it to sees. With an MDL, the data is protected, as Ryan has said. Only the user, the holder of the MDL, can decide with whom to share, what to share, and when to share. And they make that decision as they're standing there. So having the control of just sharing what you want to share, no matter what they're asking for, even if the relying party asks for everything on your card in an electronic request, you as a holder only share what you want to. So if they ask for everything and you just want to show your picture in your date of birth or, or that you're over 21, that's what you share. Then the relying party decides whether or not they want to go through the trend with the transaction, but you've only shared what you wanted to. So the control the user has over their own data is a huge benefit over a physical card. And then for all the reasons that Ryan and Paige have talked about for how you can uh, deprovision if you lose your phone and all those. Those are all advantages, but the, the biggest advantage is being able to control and only share what you desire to share, with whom you desire to share it. And they can't take that off in the back and then run a scan with somebody else. You, you're only sharing with the relying party standing in front of you. All right, before we get into the uh, uh, questions from the floor, I do want to ask each of our three panelists, since we are here in North Carolina and this is a topic of interest for uh, North Carolina DMV and DOT and, and, and ultimately with the legislature. What advice do you have for North Carolina as it relates to MDL, either based upon challenges you had in your implementation or lessons learned? What advice would you have briefly uh, for the Tar Heel State? Don't overthink it. Do not create something so impossible that you cannot actually put it in, and implement it. You can always remove it. But if you just, the, the majority of what you're going to see is when you actually put it out there. That's when you learn. And that is the best advice I can give to any state, is to just don't overthink it. So I have a couple of things that I would, I would suggest. Um, <laughs> as we went into this, um, this was done by our legislation. Like it started with legislation and didn't start within the driver's license division or the DMV. And I think that it needs to start there and then be presented up instead of being presented back backwards, as I would put it, because we felt like we were scrambling to get things done. So the pre-planning, it, it's coming. Like mobile driver's license is coming. So you might as well start preparing now and be prepared for what you want to implement. There, there's a lot of different Im implementations. Paige talked about her wallet solution, which has all these other advantages, um, other divisions, the, the Department of Natural Resources or, or Wildlife um, joined, you know, all these places. Ours is just a, a license. Um, we're, we're even, for yes, for now. Um, we are even separate from the DMV in the state of Utah, so we're only driver's license division. 
DMV is a separate branch. They're with the Tax Commission. We're with Public Safety, so we work with the Highway Patrol um, and, and Public Safety part of things. And so ours is just a license. And, and you know, moving to a wallet is a great idea because it implements and, and brings in these other agencies and encourages them to use it and have a, a place to use it. But the one last thing that I think that we did correct, but I wish we had done more of, is the relying party that I talked about. Because every single day I get an email that I have to respond to, or 10, or 20, that says, why can't I use this here? Why couldn't I use this at this restaurant? Why couldn't I use this here? This police department didn't accept my MDL. Um, and they want to use it. People want to use it. Even with all of the work that we did, I wish I had been more aggressive or had a bigger team to be aggressive and have those places to use it so that people can actually utilize the MDL. All right, Mike. I think one of the first things to consider is the ecosystem inside your jurisdiction to establish identity is already set. The DMV issues your identity when you go get a driver license or identi identification card. And so MDL is not an IT project, it's a DMV project to extend their driver license to an electronic version. So the first thing I would say is make sure you keep your identity experts in the game and create your solutions around what the needs are of the DMV to issue that credential and extend it to a digital form. Uh, the next thing I would say is remember who is using the credential and to Paige's point, don't overthink it. Ish create something that's usable, user friendly, that the interface is user friendly so that they can actually use it and will. En engage relying parties early, often, and always. They're going to tell you whether or not it's working and they're going to tell you what changes might need to be made so that the users can use it in more places and keep iterating. Uh, it isn't a once, once and done kind of thing. Uh, the MDL is going to continue to grow in its use cases, its uses. It's gonna be used in places we never even thought of. But what you don't wanna do is make it where you can't use it in the places that they use their physical card today. So never forget what they're actually doing with it now. All right, well that concludes the panel portion of our discussion. Now I'm gonna have some questions from the audience. And we do have, uh, Marty will provide a mic. If you have a question, please indicate by raising your hand. And I see a couple hands, Marty, right there. And if, you'll, if the questioner will indicate to whom you're asking the question or if it's for the panel as a whole. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all for being here. Um, I have a question for uh, Michael, I'm sorry, and for Paige. And Ryan. Mm -hmm. So my first question, uh, no, I, I haven't checked AMBA's website, but do you all have model legislation for this? And does that model legislation indicate that persons relying on the uh, MDL are to give it the same deference as they would the plastic credential? That's question one. Funny you ask the question. We had model legislation on our website up until about a year ago. We pulled it down because there were some things that needed to change. There's some updates to the standards, some modernization efforts that we needed to make with the, with the legislation. Our board meeting is next week, I think. Yes, next week. They are voting on the new publication for the legislation, model legislation that will go up right after that happens. So it will be there in about a couple of weeks. It does not address specifically what relying parties should be doing with it in the way you asked. But what it does is it gives the state a framework to look at of things they need to consider as they're creating their own and changing their own legislation. So you would consider as part of that legislation whether or not you want to require relying party acceptance if they do have one. But one thing you need to be careful, I would say be careful of, I recommend you be careful of, Day one, relying parties will not have the capability to consume an MDL. So you need to be sure that they're still required to carry their physical as the backup. Um, one of the things I will say that we put in the legislation is the, if you have both, the one that takes precedent, if it can be used, is the MDL because it will be the most up-to-date. It will have been refreshed the most recent. 
helpful to know because I, I wouldn't want to be in a position where people say, uh, as Brian encountered, I can't use it here, I can't use it there, what's the purpose of this? It's useless. I don't want that to happen here in North Carolina. And so Paige and Ryan, my question is specific regarding organ donation. Um, <laughs> is that real time, is that, does, the, does the holder have real time capacity to change that, A, and what questions, if any, do you ask the customer about organ donation if they've already selected it at the last issuance? Um, organ, well, I wanna, let me go back to your first question about the legislation. We actually do have legislation that we entered into, I think 2016, and like I said, it was designed to specifically say simple traffic stop because we just wanted to see what would happen. But we knew we had to make somebody use it or it wasn't gonna happen. In 2020, we did a, a cleanup in our legislation to say that, if they, that entities are required to accept that as an equivalent as the car, the car credential. So we did have to do a little bit of cleanup. But like Mike's saying, be careful. You know, don't put so much. You can't put nothing, because I don't care what you do, you gotta have them people say, I can't fly with it. Well, give me time, I'm trying to get you there, man. Like, work with me a little bit. But you're always gonna have that. So I wouldn't, no matter what you do. Now, as far as like organ donation, it is real time. They are allowed to actually, I don't know the specific questions because I've been an organ donor for years, but um, LOPA is the organization that worked with my vendor to create that. And so the person can go in and actually mark organ donation and it's immediately acceptable. And if they want to remove it, you immediately remove it. Well, that depends, you know, I got some little gifts right here. So whoever's the most interactive, I have things to give away. Just so you know, <laughs> just a little heads up. You can have it. All right. So we didn't. Uh, we have organ do donation as an indicator on our MDL. However, we don't have an avenue for people to change that. There are some things that we allow them to change. You can go in and update your address um, because we have a law in our books that say you need to notify the driver's license division within 10 days of, of moving. And so if they go in and update that online, then it immediately updates to the MDL. But organ donation isn't one of those. And the way that we viewed that up to this point is it's a, it's a third party, it's a third party entity. And in order to implement that, we would have to give them backwards access to our database, which becomes tricky. And so um, that's one of our real holdups is we don't want to be sharing that back and forth. And so if they come in and update it in our office, we can immediately update it. But we don't have an online option for them to update the such things as the organ donation. And then the legislation, we did put into legislation that a, a digital credential is basically the equivalent of, of a license. But we did not put a requirement like uh, Louisiana did that anybody specifically has to take that. All right, uh, next question. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, one question I have is, which is gonna be important to the General Assembly, is what is the cost to implement this if we can get a roundabout idea I of that? Zero dollars to the state of Louisiana. Um, they came, we actually had this as an innovative idea that was attached to our credit card debit card solution. And back then when people would actually apply for these the RFPs, we would grade you, which I wasn't even on that board, but they would grade, and part of it is if you get Hudson points, if you're a state, you know, if you're based in our state, and you also get innovative ideas. So when we decided to go down this path, it was easy, we already had a vendor. You know, they, they had already presented in their contract. So the, we went to legislature, and they actually added what they call a service fee. It was a convenience fee. So that's how they made their money. They would charge $6 for every, well they charge $5.99, but the law said up to $6 per application. Then when things started to grow, they actually decided we're gonna give it to y'all for free. And those back end processes I was talking about, like the verifying of um, like the waiter, whenever you drop alcohol off at somebody's house, those people have to pay to use, but it's a no cost to the state. So we win $0. Utah. Follow up with that. Um, so then you're going to charge a fee. So would there be a fee as well? We always have a, already have a fee for driver's license. 
So that would be an addition to that, right? It was originally set up that way, but um, it was so that it was a no-cost solution to me. They would recover their cost by charging that up to six dollars. They did that for about the first six months, maybe, and then something happened, and they've been really good about it. When COVID happened, they just put it out there for free. And the more people we got on board with that, the more they saw the that that fee wasn't where they wanted to be. They wanted someone to have the ability to make decisions to do things such as renewal. We allow them to renew through the app as long as they're eligible. So they can charge a service fee on that, which is already written for our other third party entity. And when you say they, you're talking about the vendor, is that yes, correct? Yes, my vendor, yes. Would you mind identifying who your vendor is? My vendor is Invo. Um, it's a Louisiana based um, tech solution company that we started doing business with, like I said, with the credit card, debit card solution, and then it came, and I've, I've been, I'm now I'm a field administrator, but I was actually over the driver's license and CEO programs at headquarters for several years. And I've worked with a lot of vendors on a lot of things. And one of the things that I loved about this company was the fact that I never had to revisit it. All right, let's go to Utah, since we're running out of time. Utah, what was your experience with cost? So for our expenses uh, ran a little bit different. And, and Yes, I didn't break. This is my theme today. Um, so with Utah, we had a little bit different experience. Um, and when we say no fee, that is never no fee. Like somebody's paying for something somewhere, right? So um, there's some solutions out there. The Apple solution is offering a no fee sort of thing, but there still is a fee. Uh, our, our developers are, are spending you know upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars in development in order to get those APIs right and then to connect and make sure everything works. So there are fees behind this. Um, with ours, the state is not charging a fee to the consumer. So the driver's license division has no fee that's passed on. And we did that because we didn't want uh, the general public to pay for the MDL. We only want people that get the MDL to have that. So um, we are, our fee comes from having the app. And so our vendor collects that uh, directly to have the app. So they offered it you know, free throughout the pilot and then a uh, free trial period uh, to, to have the MDO to see if you want that. And then they have an app fee, which people are used to paying an app fee. And we've had really no flashback or, or kickback from that up to this point. All right, from Anvis perspective, what's happening in the states about the cost of the states for implementation? They're actually all over the board. Um, and it's dependent really, uh, it seems to me in what I've seen, on where the jurisdiction is in their modernization processes for their systems. So if you are running an old mainframe back-end system that's updated every night or a couple of days, and you're trying to write an API to that to, to deliver data back to a device, that may or may not cost you a little more than if you're already modernized and you're just you've already built out a stub for data transmission and you just need to, to connect to it. Um, some states, uh, I know of a couple of states, and I won't name any of these, but they've, they've anywhere from 750 to a million to implement and maintain. Uh, there was not a fee to the customer at all, so it was basically a creation and maintenance kind of a, a, a appropriation. I've seen where they've also looked at increasing their driver license cost. So if they're at $48 today, then maybe they're $52 tomorrow, and that extra pays for some of their systems. So there, there's models across the states of how they're trying to fund some of these, but many of them are using their modernization dollars to create their MDL programs while they're modernizing their systems. Sorry, I don't have an actual figure, just really dependent. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, yes. Deputy Commissioner Charlotte Boyd Millett. I didn't want you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you all answered my question. I wanted to make sure, Paige, you were clear about the separation in fees, MDL fees versus the fee yes. for the actual plastic. Will you get the first prize? Come on down. <laughs> Thank you. Come on down. Get the other um, question that I had was resistance. We've had some resistance in North Carolina uh, with regard to implementing the MDL. Um, but you hit it on the head. You have to keep it separate from IT projects. Um, it has to stay with MDL. So some of the resistance. Could you talk a little bit more about the resistance that you may have seen from the AMBA level or 
in your states, please? Uh, sure. So I've actually seen several things happen in, in different jurisdictions when it comes to MDL. It's the next new toy for policymakers, I will say that. And, and I don't mean that to make it sound like it's not important. It's very important. But it's the next new thing. It's the next digital thing, the IT thing that's coming down the pike. Um, the last time, several years ago, um, blockchain was the big topic. And we talked about a lot about blockchain. It's kind of gone by the wayside, but MDL is kind of the next thing. And so what happens is the legislat a legislator or a governor says he hears a pitch, he or she hears a pitch, and they go to their DMV and they go to their IT shop and they say, hey, I want this as quick as you can get it. Well, now you've got, and I've seen this in several states, you've got the IT shop, which may be a separate entity, not in the DMV, saying this is mine. And then you've got the DMV saying, well, I'm not going to give you the data because that's mine. And now they're, they're bumping knuckles around things that is really a state issue, but it belongs to the DMV because the DMV knows how to identify people and issue a credential. The IT portion of this is just the actual provisioning down to the device and building the APIs so that that can happen. So um, to answer that question, the resistance once they work all that out, and there's a couple of states that actually have worked that out and have now implemented, once they work that out, it, it works well. And I have not seen it yet start out with an IT shop and stay with an IT shop, if that helps. I've seen right. it go actually the other way and come back to the DMV. They manage the project. IT helps with the build, in, build out, but it's still a, the, op, the ownership belongs to the DMV. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. It's for the panel. Um, in a fully adopted MDL world, criminals, let's say, cannot no longer steal your identity. Um, criminals that. are still going to criminal. Yeah. And has there been any forethought about the other ways criminals might criminal, like brute force or like we see carjackings all the time. It's like in the future, in adoption, we have, we'll just, we'll have more We'll have more problems, we just don't know what they are yet. Um, yes, there's been some thought about that. And you're talking about the fraud world where identity theft is, is, is happening. Remember that an MDL is an extension of an already created credential. And once that cre credential is issued and you issue to a person, that credential is issued to the person. There has to be some things considered in the provisioning to assure yourself that you're actually dealing with the right person but the identity still happened in this before they issued the credential. So what I think is going to happen is things are going to go reverse. I think people are going to try to be identified inappropriately. In other words, they're going to be identified. I'll try to identify as Ryan at the DMV to establish identity as Ryan and then issue my credentials from there as opposed to the difficulties that are going to happen with trying to defraud an MDL they want to have an MDL issued to them in a fraudulent identity, but they got it at the DMV. And that may not answer completely your question, but I think the fraud term is going to actually start at the end. It's going to start earlier than it does today. Wait for the mic. So if an assailant came up to your car with a gun and said, I want you to get on your phone and do this, and then he takes your phone, I mean, that's, I mean, that's kind of a case. I don't know. I'm just like, I'll give it to him. He can have it. Right. <laughs> so, 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 what's the failsafe? Is that what you're saying? The failsafe is they can never do anything with it once they physically coerced you to give it to them. Uh, I'm saying that if the relying party is authenticating the way they should be, the photo always goes over with the data, so they're going to see that that's not the same person if they try to use it. Um, yes, like Paige, he would have my phone, and yeah, I would be out it. of there. But you but know, I, I get what he's saying though. Like you know. Like right now, you're saying like if he made me do this, would he keep it? If I live through it, then I would I could just wipe it myself. Yeah. So he wouldn't be able to use it, but about a minute by the time he got it. But I probably wouldn't live through it. So. All right. Well, <laughs> I mouth, think. I won't <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sad to report that we are uh, nearing the end of 
uh, my time and the panel's time. I'm going to call back up uh, Board of Transportation member uh, Mitchell to give us some final, final thoughts uh, before we close. I want to thank everybody for being here and just uh, watch this space. MDL is part of the modernization across the states, and it's going to be important that North Carolina learn where it has succeeded uh, and also learn from where there have been some challenges in the other states and I look forward to us continuing this conversation. Uh, Board Member Mitchell, Mike is yours. Thank you, Commissioner Goodwin, uh, Ms. Paxton, Mr. Williams, and Mr. McCaskill for an insightful presentation. Let's give him another hand. As we wrap up this session, I'd like to take a minute to thank our partners, NCGO, for hosting the 2023 North Carolina Transportation Summit. I also want to thank our sponsors who helped make this event happen. Uh, if you have not done so already, please visit the exhibit hall downstairs. There's, there's four, there's, there you will find some impressive technology and companies displays. Make sure you also visit NCDOT Office of Civil Rights Business Development Zone and the exhibit hall for a great networking opportunity. There will also be more time to network tonight between 5 and 7 uh, in the exhibit hall during a vendor's reception sponsored by HNTB. Again, thank you for attending this session. And we will look forward to seeing you tonight uh, during the HNTB vendor reception. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good job.